Hello. Hello, good morning. My topic today is on f mod alpha, which is one of the new drugs which has been approved for Mycenae gravis. So before I begin, I want to tell you a little bit about Mycenae gravis. And we all know it's, an, it's, a, very, it's a chronic autoimmune disease and it can, be, it can really impair quality of life. And sometimes it can even be life-threatening. So some of the symptoms are, symptoms involve ocular motility, um, uh, speech impairment, swallowing, trouble with swallowing, mobility, and even respiratory function. So going to the pathophysiology behind it, in 85% of the cases, it's due to autoantibodies, and these are IgG. We have identified three types of uh, autoantibodies that are usually involved, and the most common type is the skeletal muscle nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and then you have the uh, musk antibodies, and then you have the LDL receptor related protein 4 as well. However, we need to keep in mind that in 15% of the cases, no antibodies are detected. However, however, you do see like a classic presentation of Mycenae gravis. And so what these antibodies do is that they block the receptors and this causes accelerated internalization and degradation of the receptors. And ultimately it causes damage to the NMG. That is the neuromuscular junction, which impairs neuromuscular transmission. One more thing is that the IgG1 variant are uh, autoantibodies such as the skeletal muscle nicotinic acetylcholine receptor antibodies and the LDL receptor related protein 4 also activate uh, the complement system <clears throat> and cause further inflammation. Right. Uh, now, the existing treatments are mainly steroids, immunosuppressants, and for symptomatic relief, it's acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Now, the problem with these treatments is that they cause generalized immune suppression and their adverse effects, um, for example, for steroids, you have obesity, hypertension, and uh, so on. <clears throat> so the new therapies right now, uh, what they're coming up with is something which is more targeted to just my senior gravis, so just the antibody itself. One of that is the C5 complement inhibitors, which inhibits the C5 complement, that is revoluzumab. And what I'm going to be focusing on over here is the neonatal FC inhibitors, that is FGAR to get mod alpha. <clears throat> now, what is neonatal FC receptor, first of all? It is an MHC class 1-like molecule. And what it does is that it prolongs the half-life of IgG. That is, it binds to IgG and it prevents it from lysosomal degradation. And this increases its half-life and it allows IgG to circulate for a longer period of time and it recycles it ultimately. That's what it does. So what Evgartikimod is, is that it is a human IgG1 antibody FC fragment. So what this does is that it goes, it's, it has a higher affinity for FC, uh, FC receptor compared to IgG. So it binds it before it can bind IgG. And therefore IgG loses its protection and it undergoes more degradation and decreases its half-life. <clears throat> um, right. So this particular drug was approved for generalized Mycenae gravis in the United States in 2021. Now we're coming to the study, which you know led to further studies and ultimately approval, and that is the ADAPT study, ADAPT study. So the design of the study was, it was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multi-center phase three trial in patients with generalized myasthenia. And it was conducted over 26 weeks in a total of 167 patients. And these patients, they were recruited from uh, 56 centers, neuromuscular centers across Japan, Europe, and Northern America. The inclusion criteria was that they need to be 18 years old, and they need to, they could either have positive antibodies or not, but they need to be classified according to the Mycenae Gravis Foundation of American class two to four. And they had, this score is very important. They had a Mycenae Gravis activities of daily living score of at least five. So that is MGADL. It's going to crop up several times throughout the study. Now, one other inclusion criteria was that they needed to be on at least one treatment for generalized myasthenia gravis. It could either be acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, steroids, or any immunosuppressant. 
And this was before screening and throughout the entire duration of the trial. Now the exclusion criteria was, if they've received anything like rituximab, ecolizumab, undergone thymectomy, they've done IPIG or plasma pharesis, uh, they have hepatitis B, hep C, uh, active HIV, um, low IgG counts, and if they were pregnant. Now, <clears throat> so patients were assigned one in the one to one ratio to either f mod or placebo, and they stratified the population uh, according to the acetylcholine receptor antibody status, uh, if they were taking non-steroidal immunosuppressants or not, and if they were Japanese or no. Now, the procedure itself. So f mod was given in infusion cycles and it was 10 mg per kg. And so usually per cycle, you have four infusions and that means one infusion per week for four weeks. And after you were done with four infusions, that is one cycle completed, they were given at least five weeks of follow-up uh, to assess how they were doing. And if, if there was improvement noticed, then, then they could do another cycle uh, after four weeks or so, but no sooner than eight weeks from initiation of the previous cycle. So over a course of 26 weeks, uh, you can only undergo maximum three cycles. So this is just a brief overview of what happened. So ultimately, we had 216 patients were screened, but enrolled by a total of 167. Out of these, in one is to one ratio, they were assigned to Gartikimod or to placebo. <clears throat> and this was an intention to treat uh, study. So as you can see, this is um, ultimately 79 completed treatment and 73 did not complete treatment. However, they were included in the results, even those who discontinued due to various reasons. Now, how did we assess the efficacy, whether it really worked or not? So the assessments of efficacy were done every eight weeks after initiation of, the eight, uh, of each cycle. So the first thing was the Mycena gravis activities of daily living scale. This, and then we have the quantitative Mycena gravis score and Mycena gravis composite score and 15 item revised version of the Mycena gravis quality of life questionnaire. And finally, the EQ5D quality of life scale. So how do we decide if something was efficacious? We mainly looked at the Mycin and Gravis activities of daily living scale. And if they found that from the baseline, there was um, a reduction of two or more points, it was considered uh, effective. At the same time, we also checked the uh, autoantibody levels and normal immunoglobin levels at the same time. So the autoantibodies we were looking for were the anti acetylcholine uh, receptor antibodies and the musk antibody. So what were the outcomes? So we had primary endpoints and secondary endpoints. The primary endpoint was the proportion of acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients. So it was only in these positive patients who were um, myasthenia gravis activity of daily living responders. What that means is that after the first cycle, that means in the first four to eight weeks, if their score had improved by two points or more, that was considered the primary endpoint. Whereas the secondary endpoint assessed all the other um, scales, such as the QMG, the quality of life, and also in um, antibody negative patients as well. <clears throat> um, okay. So moving on to the baseline demographics, as I mentioned before, 216 were screened and there were a total of 167. Now, out of those, what is important to note is that 77% were antibody positive and only 38% were antibody negative. So it wasn't completely equal, um, the positive and negative. And uh, only 4% were musk antibody positive. And uh, however, this did represent the general generalized myasthenia gravis population. Now, this is the baseline demographics, and I want to focus on three main things. They were equally matched across the placebo and the treatment group. However, however, if you notice, those who had undergone previous thymectomy, the f people had, those who received f had undergone, 70% of them had undergone previous thymectomy. And 
And as I mentioned before, the acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients uh, constituted around 77% of the overall population. And, and finally, when we look at the total myasthenia gravis activity of daily living score, that is the baseline score, it was already quite high, meaning it was nine or eight. <clears throat> despite these people, despite these people receiving either steroid or immunosuppressants or something or other, it was still high. <clears throat> so coming down to the results. So in the results you can have a look here is that we're looking at all the uh, scales or the MGADL score. I'm gonna begin with this one over here first. So, so the one in blue is the Afghatikmot group and the placebo group is represented in red. So over here, over around eight weeks, you can see how the points have dropped, meaning the lower the point, the better the improvement. And for us, negative two or more is considered efficacious. So uh, as you can see in this first graph over here, that over the first few weeks, the scores consistently dropped, indicating there was, it was effective in treatment and improving, um, improving their quality of life. And the maximum effect was reached around four weeks. And this was consistent across the other scores as well, except for the last one, that is my stink rabbit. Uh, Gravis quality of life score, in which the maximum effect was reached around five weeks. <clears throat> now, this can be summarized in this table over here. As you can see, in cycle one, that was the primary endpoint, 68% versus only 30% responded. And, the, and this was significant because the p-value is less than 0 0.001 and the odds ratio were 4.95. Similarly, for quantitative myasthenia gravis responder cycles, 63% responded versus 14% in the placebo group. And so on and so forth, you can uh, have a look at this. Most of these values were significant. And what is important is that we wanted to check when would the effect start waning? When can we see that you know the, the symptoms are worsening again? For people who had taken Afgartikimod, we noticed that after a period of 35 days, the effect wore off and they weren't feeling that well. Whereas in the placebo group, in only eight days, they reported that, yeah, we're not feeling well, there was no effect, or we're back to baseline. <clears throat> uh, now, this is something which represents the minimum improvement. In uh, minimum improvement is basically how much, like what was, so for example, 77% of the population, uh, sorry, the treatment group people saw a minimal improvement of at least two by two points in the score. And so this, you can see that versus in 48% in the placebo group and so on and so forth. You can see the blue represents the treatment group and the red represents the placebo group. And this is consistent with the quantitative myasthenia gravis score as well. Um, and one more thing to notice is that for some people, it was minimum of two score points that improved, or for some people, it went up to even nine and 10. So the score improved by nine or 10 points, which is considered incredible. So summary of the results, I think I've summarized it all over in the, by the tables on the charts, you could have seen that. So I'm going to just go over this very quickly. Um, yeah, okay. So coming down to the adverse effects. So the adverse effects, what was noticed was that both of them were head to head more or less, but the most common adverse effect were just headaches, but it doesn't, it's not very significant as the placebo group as the placebo group also had around 28% of them and 29% of them also had headaches as well. And uh, yeah, otherwise no serious adverse event uh, occurred. Those adverse events which did occur was not related to, they were unrelated like uh, myocardial ischemia. Some had to, um, some got pregnant so they were discontinued from the group and so on. 
So the pros and cons is that it is clearly effective. It has a very early onset of action, as can be noted before from the charts, that improvement started within two weeks of starting treatment. That is two weeks of the first shot. Uh, it was well tolerated. The side effects, the most common one were headaches, and there were no serious adverse events as such. And it is a very selective action. It, so it is a targeted therapy. And what it does is that although it decreases the levels of IgG, the body is still able to produce IgG. That means it can still mount an immune response. However, the cons would be is that it is a monoc it is an antibody at the end of the day, so it could be pretty expensive. Now, what are the limitations of the study itself? The limitations of the study is that the length of follow-up limited was only over 26 weeks. However, they did follow this up with ADAPT plus studies and so on to monitor its effects. And another thing is that there weren't enough antibody negative patients that were recruited. So amongst that population, if you consider the power was uh, pretty low because 77% of the population were antibody, uh, 70, uh, antibody positive. <clears throat> so what are the potential is that this, this therapy is not just being, it hasn't just been approved for my senior gravis, we are lo also looking at applying it in for immune thrombocytopenic purpura because it also targets the IgG, specifically IgG1, and bullispemphigoid, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy, and also autoimmune myositis. These are my references, and I'm done with the presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you.